Welcome to this free immigration help channel. Today is May 17, 2023, and we are getting into the volume 93 of me answering your immigration related questions. Uh, before I begin, as always, I'm going to mention I am not an immigration attorney. This is not a legal advice. All the information provided in these videos on this channel are directly from official government sources like USAS and, of course, the Department of State with their visa bulletin. So let's start with the very first comment from Dennis. To four, Dennis, thank you very much for another question. As you can see, the heart right here means Dennis uh, uh, got quite a lot of uh, comments in, so I really, really appreciate it. As many questions, uh, as many comments you guys have, uh, they're always welcome on this channel. So Dennis is asking, hi sir, why is NVC not updating those backlog to move it faster, especially the F11 is overdue? So F11 is a subcategory of first preference category F1, which is the uh, unmarried sons and daughters of US citizens who are over 21. And Dennis is correct. You know, we, we, we have seen some, we have seen some updates on April visa bulletin. We have seen some updates on May visa bulletins. On May visa bulletin, we've seen some pretty good updates. And honestly, I think everybody was hoping, I was hoping personally, because I do have um, an I-130 petition that is pending. I was hoping that we will see, we will start seeing a consistent movement on these different categories. But unfortunately, as recently uh, as, you know, as you guys know, if you haven't seen that video yet on June 2023 Visa Bulletin, um, there was absolutely no movement at all. It was literally a copy paste from may visa bulletin it's really sad and honestly i i am having a hard time trying to understand why that happened because we did see good movement on we've seen okay movement on april and then we've seen really good movement on may and absolutely no movement on june i don't know why it's really strange but really the only thing that i can say here dennis and for everyone who's wondering the same question is we will have to wait and see another couple months see what's gonna happen if we will see another movement if we see no movement in July 2023 visa bulletin then it's it's not good it's it's not good news um, we will see but we might see a few months movement on July if we see a few months movement ahead, then it means they just did not have time to update June visa bulletin properly and they had to copy paste the stuff from May. I'm really hoping, but really, unfortunately, that's all I can say, Dennis, unfortunately. Uh, so let me put this and we're going to move on to the next question comment from Muhyiddin Bashir. Muhyiddin, by the way, thank you very much for being publicly subscribed to this channel. I really appreciate it. Hello and thanks for your help. We really appreciate it. So, like us, like us for the spouse, how we can do, we feel like everything we get approved in USAS and transfer to NVC since December 2022. So we filed and we responded in January 18, but since we are waiting. Okay, Mohidin, so I'm going to ask you a follow-up comment, probably, if you can clarify a little bit of the, um, just a little bit of the information. Were, did you get the response from NVC saying that you're documentarily qualified since January 18 this year? Because if that's the case, then congratulations, you have accomplished a huge milestone. Huge milestone. Becoming documentarily qualified is a huge milestone. Um, and really, from then on, it's just waiting for the interview to be scheduled. Your case is really no longer with... I mean, it's still within the Department of State jurisdiction and, you know, Bureau of Consular Affairs because they're the ones who oversee the process of issuing the immigrant visas through the U.S. embassies around the world. Um, and most of the times, in, I would say, 90% of cases, it takes around six months, maybe a little bit more, eight, nine months, possibly. Um, I've seen it um as as early as three months the interview schedule and i've seen some people waiting for year year and two months in the immediate relative category that is and that's what it sounds like you are because you're talking about the spouse spouse unless of course you are in f2a you know permanent resident filing for spouse because if you're in f2a then you are dealing with the visa backlog if you are in the immediate relative category then there is no 
backlog uh, that is applicable to you because in the immediate relative category, the, the immigrant visa is immediately available really as soon as it is approved by USAS. So all you need to do really is become documentarily qualified with NVC and just you know get the interview, go for the interview and get that immigrant uh, visa. So at this point, if you are already documentarily qualified and you please let me know if you can in follow up comment, I would really appreciate it. If you are already documentarily qualified, then you don't have to worry about anything. What you can do is you can reach out to the um, US embassy in the country where beneficiary is and see if you can get information on when that appointment will be scheduled. They don't always give out that information. Sometimes they just say, we can't give you that information. But sometimes I've seen cases where they do and if you can get an answer from them and they can tell you, oh yeah, we have four months in a, you know, ahead, five months ahead, you can you know, have a rough estimate for yourself when that interview is going to be scheduled. But if you're not documentarily qualified yet, then check out the video on this channel I've made uh, in fact, here it is actually, the next question from Masood is on this video. It's called Documentarily Qualified, what does that mean? Real NVC case status, something some, I don't remember already what it was. But basically in that video, I show an actual NVC portal um, and the person who was already documentarily qualified. So it's a real case that was already documentarily qualified. And there you can see um, which civil documents you need to provide, which financial documents affidavit of support, DS-260, the application for immigrant visa, and also the fees. So everything that is involved in the process of becoming documentarily qualified. So everyone who's watching this video, you know, if you don't have a full access to the NVC portal yet, and you're waiting for that access to be given to you, check out that video because it will allow you to get insight into what to expect and you can prepare everything in advance. So once your portal fully opens up to you, you can just log in, have everything ready and just pay the fees, fill out the applications, couple days, literally, and that's it, be done with it and become documentarily qualified pretty quickly. Uh, so yeah, Mohidin, if you can come back and let me know, uh, that would be great. Just please make sure not to respond to my comment here. Just submit a separate comment because, and uh, that goes for everyone, if you're responding to my comment within your comment, for some reason, YouTube does not send me those notifications. All right, let's move on to the next one from Masood Khan. Hi, my case is IR5, Islamabad, Pakistan. IR5 is an immediate relative category, so immigrant visa is immediately available once you're approved by USCIS. And I'm pretty sure IR5 is for parents of US citizens. Priority date is 2nd August 2021 and documentarily qualified 29 September 2022 and now we are at 17 May 2023 still waiting for interview any idea how long we have to wait more thanks regards so Masood yes like I've been answering to Muhyiddin whenever it comes to the immediate relative category your immigrant visa is already for for the beneficiary if you're a beneficiary or if you're a petitioner the immigrant visa is already available you're already documentarily qualified so you're past that stage so so far it's been what September, well, it was the end of September, you became documentarily qualified. So December, January, February, March, April, and then we are in half of May, so let's count. So it's been like five, six months, which is still you're within the normal, basically scheduling. Uh, you probably have possibly another, might be another few months. Now, I don't know how busy the uh, embassy in Islamabad is, but I'm thinking it might be pretty busy in Pakistan, Islamabad. Uh, but you can, if you want to, you can reach out to them and I'll actually show you how you probably know how to find the information, but I'll use it as an opportunity to show everyone who's watching this video. You just go to usembassy.gov and that basically gives you a list of all the countries. So we're gonna scroll down to P, find Pakistan, and there you go. Oh, there are actually, wow, there's actually, wow, you guys have a lot of embassies. You have, you have one, two, three, four embassies there. So what does it tell me? It tells me that most of them are pretty busy. There's a lot of stuff that is happening, but if it's in Islamabad, then you know that the interview is going to be in Islamabad. Here's their phone number. Give them a call. 
be polite, be professional, just say that, hey, you know, I have I-130 petition, I was already documentarily qualified, and this is the immediate relative category, so the immigrant visa is already available. I was just wondering to see if you can give me approximately, you know, how long I have to wait for the interview to be scheduled. I've been documentarily qualified back in September, end of September 2022. Uh, it's been almost six months, and I'm wondering if, you know, how long before you guys have the available appointments for the immigrant visa because they have a separate system for immigrant visas, they have a separate for non-immigrant staff, uh, so they kind of have to work around and, and, and schedule, schedule those um, accordingly. Don't be upset if they don't give you any information. A lot, it, it's at their discretion, so they might just say, we can give you that information, which is okay, whatever, it is what it is, you, you give it a shot. Uh, but sometimes you get somebody who's understanding on the phone and they might tell you, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, you're still within normal. We, we have, you know, you have about another two, three months bef before we have an open window for an interview. And that's really it. So you are at the very end of the process. So congratulations. The only thing that is left really is to get the, you know, do the medical examination and go for that interview and get that immigrant visa. Now, one recommendation that I'll give you uh, with the medical examination is once your interview is scheduled, it is usually, typically, most of the time, scheduled 30 days ahead. So let's say if your interview is scheduled tomorrow, May 18, it's going to be scheduled for like June 18, right? Like 30 days ahead. Um, we, so that you have 30 days in order to do that medical examination with the civil surgeon um, that is there in, in, in Islamabad. I'm sure in Islamabad they have to have their civil surgeons. Um, I would recommend doing it as soon as possible. Don't wait closer to the interview to do the medical examination. Do it as soon as possible because I've seen cases where they didn't have enough time, the civil surgeons, to transfer uh, all the medical you know, documents, whatever they do, whatever the stuff, to the embassy so that they have it for the interview. Uh, and another recommendation, make sure to read through the email very, very carefully. The email that you will get from NVC scheduling the immigration interview because there they will give you a list of documents that is required for the beneficiary to bring with them to an interview. And whenever it comes to IR5, parents of US citizen, they actually require, which is really, really weird. It's just, it's just super strange to me. But they do require, at least in everything, all the cases that I've seen personally, an original birth certificate of a child who is petitioning for their child, who is a U.S. citizen, petitioning for their parent outside of the United States, right? Who is planning to uh, immigrate. So, which means you have to send by mail or tra or with someone or however you, you, you have to find a way to send that original birth certificate because why would parents have the original birth certificate? You have the, birth, the original birth certificate. It's strange. And also another thing they do require, as of recently I started noticing, they require tax transcripts of the child, of the sponsor, petitioner sponsor, not the tax returns, which is a different document. And I've actually seen one case where uh, a person was turned around because they had tax returns and not tax transcripts. You can obtain tax transcripts through irs.gov. Uh, but again, once you get that email scheduling the interview, make sure to read through the required documentation very carefully. Alrighty, let's move on to the next one. Let me put this, I'm gonna move on to Emesium Kingsley. Emesium, thank you very much for another comment question. Really appreciate it. Good one, sir. Appreciate it, sir. My two siblings whose priority date is 5th January 2014 uh, under F1 has just received their 60 days notice letter from NVC. Nice. Documentarily qualified April 2022. So, yeah, you see, they've been, uh, wow, they've been waiting. Documentarily qualified back in April 2022. So, they waited for the availability of the immigrant visa. So, there is that involved because it's not an immediate relative category. So, it makes sense. They, they've been waiting about... Um, April, a little bit over, over a year, just a little bit over a year. Mine is still F1 category and priority date is 15th May 2015. Okay, so you are a year after, documentarily qualified May 2021. Oh, okay, so you're documentarily qualified, let's see. 
So you are documentarily qualified earlier than them. Wow. Still waiting, but the all the application was submitted at the same time. Why are mine behind to 2015 instead of same priority date January 5th, 2014? I I have honestly I have no idea. That is really strange. Uh, but that is I, I've seen it quite a lot. Same, you know, same family members. They submit because you have to submit a separate application for each family member, unless in situations where uh, the family member can have a derivative beneficiary, then you don't have to submit a separate application. Then the derivative beneficiary kind of comes apart. And derivative beneficiary, it can be, uh, you know, in some situations, a spouse and uh, children under 21. In those situations, they just go along on, on the application. But most of the times, if you're petitioning, let's say for you know both of the parents, you have to submit a separate application for your mom, you have to submit a separate application for your dad. If you're petitioning for brother and sister, separate application for brother, separate application for sister. Um, and yes, I, 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 see, I see it all the time. For some reason, I have no idea why, but you submit the applications, at the same time, same date, pay the same date, and they put a priority date, you know, um, earlier or later than the other, and then one, some, some of them they get, sometimes they get the interview together, sometimes they get the interview separately. I don't know what it depends on. I'm thinking it might depend on the location where you're filing from and which service center the application is going to. Uh, and also, I'm thinking it might depend on the location of the beneficiary, uh, which country they're in, and uh, what, basically what chargeability area they're in. Uh, but on the plus side, you're documentarily qualified, F1, let's take a look at the visa bulletin. We will do some rough estimates because you gave me all of the information except the chargeability area, so I will just look at the general old chargeability area. Uh, let's take a look, F1, so you are already documentarily qualified. So let's see, F1 looks like they, the immigrant visa is becoming available right now, as of June. Well, yeah, I know we're still in May 2023, but we have the visa bulletin for June already. Uh, but as of June 2023, the visa is becoming available for immigrants who have their priority dates back in December 2014. So your priority date is back in May 2015. So you are literally, let's see, you're 15 May and we got 15 December. So you're literally January, February, March, April, May. You're five months away from the availability of your immigrant visa. Five months away. So you're looking roughly at another five months for your interview to be scheduled. So you're really, really close. Uh, just a little bit more patience. I know it's it's, uh, it's, it's annoying when, when somebody tells you to be patient, but trust me, I can personally relate because I have to be patient for another 13 years. All right, so I completely understand how it feels. And you've been waiting for quite a long time since you know May 2015, a long time. It's, what, it's almost eight years, not almost. Eight years, exactly, over eight years. Today's May 17, and your priority date is back in May 15, 2015. So eight years. Man, that's a long time. So just a little bit more, roughly five more months, because this is the Visa Bulletin, and in the past month, it didn't update. So hopefully, we'll update in the next month, you know, and we will, we will see the good movement. Uh, but yes, a rough five more months. Museum. All right, so let me put this and we're gonna move on to the next question coming from Tang. Hello, I have watched a lot of your videos. Thanks, thank you very much. I appreciate you watching my videos. I entered the United States with a B2 visa. It has been two months and I am planning to submit a political asylum. However, I consulted a lawyer and suggested that I submit it when the visa is about to expire. Otherwise, if I fail the interview, and will not be able to enter the immigration court. Another question is that my family members will also come with me. Should I include them in the application? And if I include them, should I also go to an interview? 
What should I do if the child will not express in the interview? I really hope to get your reply. Thank you very much. Looking forward to your reply. Thank, thank you very much for your question. So it's, it's a really, really good question. And uh, I'm glad that you already consulted with a lawyer because it's good to have that kind of a contrast. I would honestly recommend if you, if you have not done it already because good attorneys, immigration attorneys, in 100% of the cases, they offer free consultation without any problems, without any boundary. They don't even try to get your address, your phone information, your whatever payment, not nothing. You can call, you can talk to directly to an attorney on the phone, immigration attorney on the phone. You can ask them the questions and they will answer your question because that's how a good attorney is when they really want to help people. They don't hold back. They don't try to lure you into paying them any money so that, oh, but you have to keep in mind that whenever it comes to the way attorneys look at everything, right? It's, it's, not, it's not their situation, all right? So they look at everything from the perspective that of, of a kind of a loophole. And you already see that, okay? They're worried that, you know, if you this, if you apply that, you know, you're not going to be able to, to the court. And really, with the recent, the way they did the changes to the asylum process, uh, because they're processing their, the new asylum application so quickly and it's like within 30 days they try to address it and whether give you an approval or denial, right? You cannot go and uh, appeal their decision to the court. That's really the difference because back when everything was normal, back when they did not s kind of a split asylum applicants into two groups, one group waiting for... 10 years now, 10 years, some, some people are waiting for their asylum interviews. They are still waiting. But if they are denied, they can go to the court and appeal the decision of the executive branch, the USCIS. And then they can go to the judicial branch, the immigration court, EOIR. And whenever it comes to the new applications, that's the separate group. That's the ones that are processed really, really quickly. They kind of did it to streamline the process, but I think they, they made the process worse. Is yes, they you know it's it's not it's not going to go. You cannot appeal basically their decision if it's denied, um, it is denied. But on the plus side, the interviews are scheduled really quickly. So the reason why the lawyer is telling you this is that you could spend more time here in the United States basically without because once you get a denial, if you get a denial, then you are automatically go into the removal proceedings. But here's the thing. If you are, you know, being persecuted in your country, if you are filing for asylum, it's a serious process, it's a, you, you, you're starting a serious process, you're providing a lot of documents, and you really don't have any options. You have to do it because otherwise you will have to go back to the country where you're being persecuted. And you definitely don't want to do that. You really, from your perspective, not, not from the attorney's perspective, but from your personal perspective, you really don't care about these loopholes. Oh, I'm going to stay in the United States for another three months and then I'll file and whatever happens, happens. If I get denied, then I'll go back to the country. No, you don't look at it this way. This is your only option. You're applying so that you can get the approval. So your, your faith into this is much stronger because you have to do it. This is what is in front of you and you have to take the step. So it really, from your perspective, it does not matter whether you file it now or whether you file it, it in four months. So I, my recommendation would be probably might not want to be dealing with an attorney like this because you know if, if they get into the consideration all these loopholes, right, so that you could, you could spend more time in the United States, that is already sort of a dishonesty, a little bit. With you, with the process in general, you might not want to be dealing with that, all right? With that being said, however, I would recommend spending some time, not rushing into the process because it is processed so quickly, because back before, you know, you would submit an application, you would have all this time in order to submit additional evidence and so far so forth. Because the process right now is sort of streamlined in a not very good way, you want to make sure that you prepare your application package as strong as possible. So all of the initial evidence, you make sure that your asylum statement, your written statement is 
as strong, as accurate as possible is backed up by as much evidence as possible. I actually do have a video on writing that um, asylum statement, asylum story, which is probably one of the more important uh, aspects of uh, asylum application package in general. Why? Because that's really what your interview is going to be based on. So they, they will get it, they will review it, and then when you go for an interview, that's based based on this statement they will ask you the questions you know so oh, okay so on this date what happened and then what did you do and da, 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 and did you try to go there to you know escape that persecution why did you have to come back to the to not come back why did you have to come to the united all the way to the united states in order to claim the asylum couldn't you have claimed the asylum anywhere else so far so forth right based on this written statement so the stronger you write it the more corroborating evidence that you have in this the stronger your case will be and really the the easier it will be for you to go through the pro interview process and, and and less of the potential there is uh, in you know getting getting a denial and of course with an attorney that is just trying to kind of prolong your stay in the United States thinking that's that's what you care because essentially this is what this attorney thinks. This attorney thinks that your asylum case merely is a way for you to stay in the United States. All right? And the longer you stay in the United States, is the better for you. Yes, technically it is the case. But it is a much more important reason. Much more important reason is that you cannot go back to the country that you came from because you are being persecuted. And when you look at it this way, it really doesn't matter, you know, whether you file all of that, you know, right now or a week before your stay here expires. And then the next question about your uh, family. Yes, absolutely. If your family is here in the United States of America, that gives you the eligibility to include them on your application. And it will depend. Uh, it might be you, the main... Um, applicant right the main petitioner for asylum and then they go as the dependents of of your on your application uh, or it might be one of them it really depends on the on your asylum story on, based on which you are claiming asylum um, so for example you know if it's you know you and your spouse in some situations it's better for you to be the you know the main petitioner and in some you know depending on how the story is it might be better for them to be the petitioner and you being the dependent. Regardless, the interview is going to be for both. Children, they don't really, you know, bother children. Um, but yes, of course, children under 21, they're definitely going to be an application. Uh, but if they're not here yet, and if you're filing for asylum, then it's going to be just you. And then once your asylum is hopefully approved, hopefully everything goes well, uh, then you would have to file a separate form um, and once your asylum is approved, that is. It's the form I-730, basically to include um, your relatives, your immediate relatives, so that they can come here and, and, and be with you. And it's, it's the same as reunification process that we talk about a lot on this channel, but it's specifically for those who have been granted asylum. So thank, hopefully I was able to kind of explain you my point of view on all of this and hopefully you will be able to make a, a little bit of a better conclusion now if you have any questions along the way i will be more than happy to answer them so don't hesitate to ask as many questions as you need Alrighty, let's uh, try to address another one for today from tung ng tung sorry if i'm mispronouncing the name hi according according to the june visa bulletin it mentioned that Additionally, number used in the F2B category has been steady throughout the fiscal year. Yeah, and it may become necessary to retrogress the final action dates for rest of the world, countries, India and China to keep number used within the fiscal year 2023 annual limit. Any thoughts on that? Tang, so this is, this is a great example of the boilerplate, copy-paste, absolutely meaningless statements from government agencies this is really what it is because f2b category has not been steady at all throughout the fiscal year the past probably what two years now 
because people who have been that that, that had that were supposed to get their interviews that they, they were supposed to get their immigrant visas back two years ago they're still just now are finally getting their interview schedule and you can see it by the category and i'll show you why i'm saying this in the visa bulletin if you will see it still says current on the f2a and then if you look at the graph a now they as of recently i think as of may if it's may or april they have updated because f2a was showing current here as well so if we look i'm pretty sure let me see i'll, I'll type in april and i think it, it was in april and if not in april then probably march let's see april no april is still already f2a is showing september 20, 2020 so september 2020 is what like roughly two and a half years ago right a little bit more i think but we will go to march there you go so you see in march 2023 it's showing current which means that there is absolutely no blo no backlog on this category. So once the you you know once you're documentarily qualified, the immigrant visa is immediately available, and you go and you get your interview. That's it, and you get your immigrant visa, right? That is in April, 2023, and then we go to in March 2023. I'm sorry, but yes, yeah, it's, it's, when when we go to April or whatever the most recent one, June, we see the backlog of two and a half years. And that is right there, a pure example of really the same thing that you posted, the same statement that they make, that, oh yeah, everything is good, everything is great, everything is process normal, steady. And then bam, two and a half years backlog, yeah. If it was steady, we would have never gotten a two and a half years backlog. So it's really, it's, 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 it's really shameful that they do that and... I don't know how they get away with stuff like this because it's it's, com it's it's complete misinformation, really. That's what it is, and to me, it's you know, just just be honest with people because these people are, you know, these are families we're talking about. These people have not seen their family members for years and years and years, and these agencies just blatantly lying to these people. It's really sad. Um, so I'm sorry, Tung, I kind of, I wish I could, you know, give you something a little bit more reassuring and a little bit more and say, oh yeah, everything's steady, but I'm an immigrant myself, I, I, I have a petition myself, I had a petition before and I've been through most of the stuff that I talk about on this channel, so I can personally relate and I know, I know for a fact that it is much better to know things as they are even though the reality might not look as good, rather than being you know, confused by all these fancy statements like, oh yeah, everything is steady throughout some fiscal year or whatever. So thank you everyone for asking your questions. Always appreciate it. As, as I always say, you know, if you have any follow-up questions, comments, uh, you're more than welcome. As many questions as you have, they're always welcome on this channel. I really hope that my answers are helpful to you. Thank you for your time. God bless. And I'll see you in the next video.